As a general fan of live service games, I'm curious to see what he's got to say. What's up, everybody? This is the Act Man here, and today I'm posting my very first live service video. Oh, I've boy. come to the conclusion that finishing my work before making it publicly available, it, it just takes too long. It's yeah. too much time and effort, and you don't want to wait for content, do you? I need the views and money right now. It's my money right. and I need it now! So if the audio levels aren't balanced properly or it keeps cutting at random intervals, <laughs> know that I'm working on <laughs> Because I'm also launching this brand new feature called free to watch videos. Oh boy. That's right. Unlike my OnlyFans, you don't have to pay me to watch garbage. However, I do know that the comment section is currently disabled. Rest assured, uh, our teams are working on that. But uh, to keep I, it I disabled. hope you keep coming back to this video to rewatch it every week. I've got a lot of great updates in store. Speaking of the store, did I mention my Patreon and OnlyFans? Okay, is the joke dead? Yes, get over there! Right, the joke's dead. <laughs> Live service video game. If you're like me, when you hear those words, you flinch a little. And if you I don't, I actually like live service video games because it feels like the game is evolving and growing over time. Uh, I, I think that there are just a few very well-known live service games that are fucking garbage, and it's hard to not think with that perspective. You hear early access before... The yeah, it, it's like it's abuses the term, like, unfinished trash. Yes, yeah, so it's like early access... Yeah, there we go. Yeah, this is fucking amazing. Crafting, early access, survival, and open world. Think about how many games run on a fucking potato that have all four of those tags. Absolutely. Yeah, if you, if you, yeah, and, and the games, they're all broken, none of them work, it's horrible. Them, you probably start blowing chunks. Yeah. Despite their lackluster reputation, live service games have become such a popular trend, it doesn't discourage every developer from attempting to make one. Exactly. I mean, literally, every single new release these days is promoted as an ongoing service. Indie fighting game? It's a live service now, boyo. Single player RPG? Nope. That's a live service too. Now, let which to be fair, apparently that helps Cyberpunk a lot. So it's it's one of these things where live service games might be a um, departure from what's usual, but it seems like it's been a positive for many of these games. Uh, I remember seeing CD Projekt Red talk about having uh, multiple days with a million concurrent players online. Let me be clear for a second. Gaming is in the best shape it's ever been. Developers True. have more tools, resources, and everything they need to make the best video game ever. Elden Ring, for example. The ability to update one. games post-launch inherently makes the whole industry better. With yes, that out of the way, live service, unfortunately, is... Because you have to keep in mind also, there are, in a video game like Elden Ring, there are infinitely more outcomes that can occur in that game because there are simply infinitely more inputs that can occur. There are infinitely more uh, things that can happen, things, different interactions between different abilities with different objects, with everything, right? So whenever you're taking a million and multiplying it by a million, it's a lot harder to just like beta test and make sure this is ready for release than whenever you're multiplying, you know, a thousand by a thousand. So because the games have so much of a larger scope now, it becomes much harder for the developers to uh, just like definitively say this game is completely finished with no bugs. It's both a perk and a crutch. It is both a cigarette and an apple. Some developers are able to capitalize on this live service model in the best ways possible. Smash Bros. Ultimate, yep. for example. Without a live service, my dream of seeing Banjo-Kazooie in Smash it's gone. You can provide constant bug fixes, new content that keeps players entertained for years. Oh, yeah. Now, who doesn't want that? That but sounds for some good. developers, the live service becomes a hindrance as they make grandiose promises of a living, breathing platform, only for that to flatline as the game turns into a ghost town. 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. Live service games, or... L that is one of the things that sucks about live service games, is that some of them come to an end, and then you're not able to play the game anymore. That's what happened with Wildstar, for example. 
Uh, it's like distortion and his viewers zipping method in Elden Ring speedrun game. I'm pretty sure testers can't find that. Exactly. And, and the truth is, like, it's easy to say that, like, oh, old games didn't have that. Old games were tested better. No, they weren't. W watch a Super Mario 64 speedrun. Watch a Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time speedrun. Watch a Super Mario uh, credits warp. They were all bugged to fucking shit whenever you have a million people playing them, sharing ideas on how to break them. Old games are simple. Yes, they old games are simple, and they still had massive bugs in them. That's my point. LSG and games as a service is simply the idea that a game will get consistent updates and grow and evolve over time. Yeah, yeah. On paper, this sounds like a, a no-brainer win. Easy. But were it so easy, as the old saying goes? Now, why has this type of game become such a popular trend? What are the problems with live service? Why is it a trend? I don't know. Maybe because of battle passes and you can sell them to people consistently and get them to come back to the game regularly without having to develop an entirely new fucking game and also sell cosmetics constantly. That's why, is you can monetize the game five or six times before it actually runs out of its uh, product cycle. It's just common sense games and what it's can what they happens. do right all these questions and more will be answered after the sponsor of today's video Who is this, this video is sponsored by the grand mafia in bad italian accents i'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse a chance to go from level one crook to level 100 mafia boss. wait is this the actual game like that you can that? beat the salami out of some bullshit <laughs> mob bosses been giving you trouble well now's your chance nice to prove hat. it kiddo the Grand Mafia is an MMORTS game where any schlub like yourself can rise through the ranks of the criminal underbelly. Recruit different- I love watching the trailers of these games. I will actually sometimes sit through them because I think they're funny. Different homies, grow your gang, take over parts of the city, yeah, they're so and dumb. expand your sphere of influence. Grand Mafia operates on international servers, making plan with people across the ocean a breeze. In Grand Mafia, only one faction can control and govern the city. Well, so basically what they mean by that is that the Dubai oil princes that have already invested $50,000 into this game, they will find you and they will farm you. That's what they mean to say whenever you can play worldwide. And you better believe you got competition. You can download and play the Grand Mafia for free. Go do it right now. Use my special code TGM ACTMAN to obtain unique rewards and participate in the Golden November Anniversary event. It's a big event where all the crime families meet up on a giant cruise and, uh... Talk things over if you get my drift. There's a bunch of mini games in the brand new Enforcer Bone Crusher. And don't forget to participate in the H5 mini game where you could win fabulous prizes like a PS5, Amazon gift card, all sorts of things. Download the Grand Mafia today. Come join my family. Check the link in the description and pin comment. And thanks to the Grand Mafia for sponsoring this video. And now for something completely different. I kind of want to wear this hat for the rest of the video. Now, before I, I empty my bowels like on the corpse of Anthem and other failed live service games, we need to know why studios shifted to this business model. Why do we, why do we go from horse armor to, to this? Well, well it's pass. not hard to understand if you understand business. Yeah. It's money. It's just good business. But you could also watch this chart of the top 15 games on Steam over the last 10 years or so. And what you'll notice is almost all of them are live service. Because that's the thing. And and that the reason why people this is the actual reason why live service games keep getting made is because people keep playing them. It's that simple. Well, oh, oh yeah, let's look at all the most successful games. Wow, all of these games are live service games. Hmm, I think I know what we should make. Yeah, they sell. Even though The Witcher 3 and Elden Ring were some of the biggest, best games ever made, yep. they still don't stay at the top for very long. I would argue, however, that in 20 years, all of those games at the top are probably not going to be out there anymore. But there are still going to be people that go back and play Elden Ring and Witcher 3. So, a, a, like, a, a single-player masterpiece game is good forever. Elden Ring peaked at 952,000 concurrent players. And it's at 20,000. That's because they don't have a battle pass. 
See, if Elden Ring had the Tarnished Battle Pass with the seasonal upgrade of the, uh, uh, the, the fucking Elden King, uh, the Elden Lord upgrade, uh, if you bought it with, uh, ten more dollars and your sword would be golden, uh, th well, then everybody would be playing it again. Okay, I can take the hat off now. I mean, from... And if they had, uh, more, uh, characters in the game that had anime boobs... Apparently, this is like the new cheat code. 2012 to 2018, EA saw their company's value go from 4 billion to 33 billion. Activision Blizzard, 20 billion to 60 billion I in the same invested. time period. Both companies yeah, largely attributed this to their games as a service business model. Yeah. LSGs have been around. The problem is that in 2012, I, um, I had about $12. So that's that's the problem. Around since the 90s with EverQuest. Yeah. My first experience was in the oh. early 2000s with World of Warcraft and everyone's favorite dating app, RuneScape. Oh, These MMORPGs with huge worlds and active player bases yeah. needed this kind of constant live support so that gamers would continue wasting their real lives building their virtual ones. Yes. Want to learn something new I today, do you? I'll learn you something. In 2003, on the original Xbox, the game Unreal Championship made history. I have that. the first console game to get a post-launch update. According to I one of no the devs, work on this patch began roughly three to four weeks. I remember this game, it didn't have inverted controls, and I would play with inverted controls on my joystick. And Unreal Tournament, I had to relearn how to play without it every single time I played Unreal Tournament. After the game shipped, and the decision to ship it came after reviewing the forums and hearing the feedback from fans about exploits that started to yep. pop up. It's important to note that the idea of post-launch yeah. support, at least on consoles, began as a way to address fan feedback and fix problems that flew under the radar. Because... What's well, still effectively what they usually do. Oh shit, we fucked up. You guys remember this one? This is a good one. He's about to go flying. Uh, you're not supposed to be flying across the map like that. Because back in the yep. day when you complained about a game on a forum, you didn't expect anything to happen. Cause oh, back in my day, these games, whatever, they came out. There were no bugs. There was nothing wrong. The game came out. It was finished. It's not like you could just super jump on top of the one platform on lockout and sit there for the whole fucking map during the entire match and headshot people until you run out of ammo. No, that couldn't happen at all. Absolutely not. Then people would have to throw grenades up there to try to get you down, but you move out of the way. Because back in the day when you complained no about way. a game on a forum, you didn't expect anything to happen because the game was out. They couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. I think once the Halo 2 map pack came out, that and... I bought this. I remember I went and I bought the Halo 2 map pack at GameStop the day it came out. I got it on the way back from school in ninth grade. Unreal Championship became the launch pad for live service games to really take off. Yeah. Unlike my fucking did, vacuum cleaner, this. I've been waiting on the new update for this goddamn forsaken piece of Which one is shit? this? Uh... Oh, that's a Hoover? Oh yeah, we had that one. Yeah, that one catches on fire. Yeah, that one, yeah, it... It, it, it was like, I had a smell on it, and yeah, this one, uh, yeah, yeah. All you have to do to understand trends in business is follow the money. Why is Activision Blizzard suddenly taking an interest in all the sexual harassment allegations floating around their workplace? It's not because it's the right thing to do, it's because they're getting sued. Yeah. Why are so many videos on YouTube exactly 10 minutes long? Money. It's eight minutes now, I'm pretty sure. Because that's when we can put mid-roll ads in. Yes. <laughs> Why is every single company putting now. a battle pass into their video game? It's because not because every player is like, yes, I, I love it. That I love good. battle passes. No, it's because money. Because why settle for a one-time purchase when you could have more? Hi, That's Billy right. Mays here. Game production used to be a fire and forget kind of business. The game launches, it's out, that's it, fellas, pack it up, we're working on the next one. And honestly, if you're gonna put that much effort into creating a game, you want it to pay off. You want it to do well and last a long time. And money makes the world go round. 
It's just good business. So well, I think it's also what the people want. I think a lot of people don't want to just play a game that is over the moment that you finish the content. They want to play a game that continuously evolves and grows and changes over time. I think a lot of people do. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm crazy, but I feel like a lot of people like the idea of live service games. Now, I understand that live service games and early access games are often an excuse, like early access. What we mean by this is that we want you to pay us now and we'll fix it later. Yes, obviously it's fucking stupid, but that's not the, uh, th that's not every single one. Companies want to avoid the risk of investing millions of dollars and thousands of man hours into a product that only turns a profit when it comes out and never yeah. after that. That's why the business model evolved. It started with expansions, re-releasing the same game, just slightly different and with new stuff. Then yep. it was DLC and map packs, horse armor, extra custom class slots, microtransactions, Ooh. loot boxes, season passes, Ooh. and now battle passes. Wow. Inflation and then there's premium battle passes, and then after you get your premium battle pass, you've got your super premium battle pass, and that's where the real good stuff is has risen but the price of new games hasn't unless you're sony and you think you're better than everyone most consoles are sold at a loss of profit developer yeah. size and budgets have risen tremendously and with that expectations companies want to avoid big risks if yeah it's like the price of making a video game has probably doubled in the last uh 20 years but the price of buying a video game has increased by like 30 percent well, where's that other? Where does that seventy percent come from? Well, that's the battle passes. That's why they do it because gamers aren't going to spend a hundred dollars, a hundred and twenty dollars for a video game. It's just not going to happen. They can placate a game's disastrous launch by saying, "Oh, it's going to be live service. We're going to work on it." Yeah. Then that's what they'll do. Live service attempts to mitigate the risks and sunk costs of game development. Used to be, you bought a game, brought it home. If it was shitty, then it was just a shitty game. That's and right. that was it. But then one night, you find yourself just staying awake thinking, man. That's actually not true. I uh, used to go to Blockbuster, you'd rent the game, and then you'd play it. And if you liked it, then you'd get your mom to buy it for you. That's what it really was. Yeah, you would rent it. And if, like, if you could beat it in the time that you rented it, then it's like you don't need to buy the game but you know like that's what it is you copy it no nah, we could you couldn't copy games until like i think maybe you could copy some playstation 2 games but that was about it it's hard to copy a fucking uh a super nintendo game man maybe superman 64 wouldn't have sucked gorilla balls if it was a live service yeah nowadays you're allowed to release bad or poorly optimized video games as long as you say well it's shitty now but but it might get better said every developer of an early access survival game trust us this one isn't a scam i don't think anyone has the boomer hot takes that games were better when they were never updated people that think that that's what you look like right there in an <laughs> ideal world True. a live service except his hair would be gray service would make every game better objectively right i'd kill a man to get more maps in mario party 3 Live service experiences weren't so controversial when it was MMORPGs, but once games like Destiny, Fortnite, and Call of Duty started picking up the torch into the mainstream, well, that's when all hell broke loose. Updates, patches, and new content are essential to the live service business model, and it's become commonplace for new titles to have roadmaps, blog posts, oh, yeah. video updates, interviews, hot fixes, new maps, patch notes battle passes seasons pass which to keep in mind elden ring had a number of these too uh elden ring had multiple balance patches and this is not new with elden ring uh dark souls 3 had this and so did um dark souls 2 this is we're taking out this character we're putting that character back in i think jeff kaplan showed his ass hair on camera at once saying it was going to be an overwatch 2 and it's like is, is the game yeah, called finished Winston. yet can i have the fun is the fun now mine the live service experience can easily get muddled and confusing to casual gamers i already keep track of my bills my insurance and the decline of my physical well-being i don't want to keep track of every update for every live service game. For example, when Halo has always had split screen campaign co-op and then one day it doesn't. Yeah, that was uh that was kind of interesting how they just get rid of split screen co-op. 
Like, I, I don't understand why why you would do that. I, I remember, like, playing split-screen co-op was fucking awesome with my friends. Like, I, I feel like every game should have to have that. It should be, like, legally required for you to have split-screen. It's like, sorry you didn't read blog post number 503-7C. Fuck you. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> On the flip side, when new season... That is true. Like, whenever... Uh, if, if you're not keeping up with a live service game, it's very easy for it to kind of leave you behind. And you come back to the game, and, like, a bunch of shit has changed. Like, I've had this happen to me whenever I come back to play Fortnite or PUBG. There's, like, six new guns. I don't know what any of them do. Where's the M4? I can't find it. What's this new fucking... It's, a, does, it's kind of like a scar, but it's not... The fuck? I thought the AUG came from the... the, the parachute box now it's on the ground oh my god this is so complicated now yeah it's it's happened with a lot of things and yeah it can be it makes it harder for people to come back and play them again are coming out for an already existing game that can generate a lot of hype but staying yeah. up to date with live like service no games particularly Fortnite. ones you're really invested in can feel like reading a fucking manga like miss one issue and now you have no idea why a support hero can outduel Reinhardt. With so many games and so many updates, players generally stick to like one or a few live service games at a time because there's such a big investment on a player's part, right? It's all yeah, the you invest a lot of time playing the game. That's the reason why MMO players are so focused on whether a game is dying or not. Because if a game is dying, then they don't want to play it because they're investing a ton of time into it. It's what makes sense reward structures the daily login bonuses yeah. daily challenges weekly challenges i kind of felt like that with tower of fantasy i've wanted to go back and play the game again but it kind of stressed me out a lot whenever i was trying to compete on the leaderboards and it's like if i wasn't doing all of my vitality dailies and playing the game every single day other people were getting ahead of me and they were a higher level and now i had to farm frontier expeditions 500 fucking times like, oh my god, it's crazy. We've taken the lead! There's all this vaulting of content and limited time events. Everyone's trying to get you to feel like you're missing out. Remember yeah. remember to rewatch this video after you finish watching it? For for the memes. But it's like, yeah, so it's like, to, are you really gonna fun. stay committed to the Vanguard grind when Modern Warfare 2 is out right now? There's people, there's probably people still playing Vanguard. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? If done right, live service can be a saving grace and a guardian angel. Absolutely. Live service in early access means developers can release their game, gauge player interest, and make changes before putting all... This is what happened with not only Valheim, which is a great example, but also with Vampire Survivors. All this fucking time and effort into a project because they might not be making a good game early access can help guide development yeah. towards the ideal finish line that the players and developers want to arrive at the best case scenario you can hope for is to be fortnite a game so yeah, good true. at its live service it's actually annoying you just had to add goku huh no i couldn't resist at that point epic games has nailed the live service model better than anyone a game like Vermintide 2 likely would have died if Fat Shark wasn't pumping out consistent updates for it. Games that would have gotten old if new stuff wasn't added. Live service can provide a lot of benefits. Yeah, Most it's important very good. among them, giving developers more than one chance to make a statement. That's very true. It's like, I think New World is an example of that. Is that whenever New World released, it was very problematic and people didn't like it for a number of reasons. And then as time went on, the game improved and people came back and they started playing it again. Uh, that's what, you know, again, and, and people can say that, yeah, No Man's Sky is another example of that. It's not copium, it's the numbers. And uh, another example of that is Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy XIV released, it was garbage, and uh, then they fixed it, and now a lot of people play it. It was an economic decision at the end of the day. You gotta cut the bridge when you realize you can't make a lot of money on something. This is what yep. EA CFO Blake, you realize- It's an economic decision at the day, you gotta cut the bridge, realize you can't make a- Oh yeah, of course. You can't make a lot of money on something. This is what EA CFO Blake all. Jorgensen said after the company shut down Visceral Studios and canceled their single-player Star Wars game. 
These are the words why KOTOR 3 doesn't exist, because it had to be KOTOR Online, and it couldn't just be Elder Scrolls 6, it had to be El- Yeah, I was one- yeah, I watched this a long time ago too. Yeah, whatever happened with- Yeah, did this- are they just gonna release Skyrim again? Like, I, I mean... Yeah, it's coming. I mean... I mean, I'm not like a huge Elder Scrolls fan. Like, maybe I'll play the new one, but like... It's, it's, it makes you think, you know? Elder Scrolls Online. Live service yeah. has become the biggest killer of creativity in the industry by far. Game development seems to have shifted towards being results-driven as opposed to fun driven. We see this attitude time and time again as far- I, I think that it's much more formulaic. I, I, I don't know if I agree with the idea that live service games have made people less creative. I, I'm not sure if I agree with that. Uh, however, I think that really whenever you're releasing a base game, there's a lot of like fundamental narrative and everything that you have to make. And so if you're releasing less of those, you could make a, uh, you know, just like a pure argument made off of volume. But on top of that, I think that there are a lot of other cases where live service games become more creative. I think that Fortnite's a great example of that, where they keep doing a bunch of new crazy shit all the time and being creative with the same game. But it depends. Back is 2012, when guess who, EA again, President Frank Gibbo said, I have not greenlit one game to be developed as a single player experience. Today, all of our games include online applications and digital services that make them live 24-7, 365. In I feel like most games that kind of makes sense for them. Like, I, I, I don't know. It depends, though. Is like a lot of games, like for example, Elden Ring, you have like invasions, you have things like that. Uh, Call of Duty, obviously, right? Halo, obviously. Like any sort of online, like a, you know, survival game, obviously. Uh, Valheim, obviously. Stuff like this. So I, I don't think that it's necessarily a problem. I think it's all of the secondary effects that live service games usually come with. Daily activities, daily tasks, battle passes that are just, uh, you know, a bunch of FOMO bullshit. I don't hate battle passes. I think battle passes are fine. But whenever every single game has a battle pass, you start having the same mindset shift that, like, back in the day when one game had a battle pass, it was like, okay, well, we just get the battle pass for this new game. And just like Netflix, right? You just had your Netflix subscription, but now you've got your fucking Netflix, your Hulu, your HBO Go, uh, your Amazon Prime. Your, um, fuck, what are some of the other ones? Uh, those are some of those that just immediately come to mind. Uh, Apple Music, uh, Showtime, like Paramount Plus, Disney, Hulu. Like, you've got all of these fucking, all of these different things, and now it's like a $10 charge for every single one of them. It's like, I thought we fucking, I thought we moved away from this with cable, and now we're getting it again. Yeah, you know, OnlyFans, of course, multiples. And, um, the fact is that, yeah, I, I think that that's the problem with battle passes also that people have is that now that every game has a battle pass, people feel like they can't play a game to its full capacity whenever they come back and they want to enjoy it because they feel like they're playing at a disadvantage because the game is designed to play best whenever you're using the battle pass. In other words, if we Twitter. can't make this game yeah. a live service, then we won't make it at all. Why? Because fuck you, give me money! You know, Bioware, there it is. yeah, that company that was renowned for making single-player RPGs? No. Hey, hey, give them an MMO FPS and let's see what happens. This idea that every game should be a platform or a service isn't exclusive to EA, but they seem to be the ones most convinced this is the only option for the future. Like, did anybody ask for Assassin's Creed to be live service? Like, isn't it enough- to be a service platform, not a game? Okay. That they already make the damn things once a year. Game development has been heading towards this homogenous blob where like every game looks the same and, and its menus are the same. And I feel like that's definitely fucking true. Like whenever I look at a battle pass for a game that I've never played, I understand it. Whenever I see a gotcha system for a game that I've never played, I'm like, okay, so that's the premium currency, that's the end game currency, that's the store points, that's the seasonal currency, okay. 
And so these are the spins for the the uh, the base characters. These are the fresh spins. Okay. All right. Yeah. And like you just, it's just everybody knows what it is, and you just do it. Yeah. It's the same shit, man. The way you unlock things is the same. With co-op coming yeah, to Dead yeah. Space Three and multiplayer rumored for Dragon Age Three, it seems that the idea of solo-oriented experiences is now dead to EA. As is variety, it seems. The inexorable march towards video games. Hey yo, don't forget that there's always going to be games like Hollow Knight. There's always going to be good single-player games that come out. They don't need to be made by EA. And the fact is that one of the great things about game development now is it's been opened up to so many more people. I can guarantee fucking to you, if I was 12 and Unreal Engine 5 came out, I would be a game developer right now. Like that's the facts. And there are and the reason I didn't do it is it was too fucking hard to do it back then. Like you had to learn all the coding and everything. Of course you still need to learn it then. But if you're 12, it was it was less evident that way, you know? Yeah, you've got Hades, like Icarus. There are many there are many games that are produced and made that are incredible now. And I do think that a lot of these massive studios like EA, uh, Ubisoft, uh, fucking Blizzard, Activision, uh, all these big places, they're, they're getting to this point where they are too big to succeed. There's just so much red tape, so much foundational problems that they have to overcome, so many types of like overlaps and like checks and balances that these games have, politics... Uh, and I'm not, I don't mean like, you know, putting a, a gay person in the game. I mean like office politics. I mean, just the different things that the games needs to appeal to. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, uh, just make these companies too slow to operate too slow to, it's like a ship, right? Like you have a massive fucking ship and it's like, it's hard to turn the fucking ship because it's so big. That's what these AAA studios are like now becoming one indistinguishable mash of gray sludge continues. Live service has radically changed the way sequels are produced, if they are at all produced. Yes. Right, Rockstar? Making new like games Overwatch is hard. Too. So let's put all our eggs in one basket and just invest- Why are you even shitting on fucking- Bro, at least Grand Theft Auto has like an active roleplay scene. Or not roleplay scene. Oh, uh, roleplay, well, I mean scene, but not- Okay, all right, anyway- Fucking, how many times have they re-released Skyrim? I mean, it's got to be 12 times. I, I think 100%. I, I, would, I would almost for sure bet that it's been released at least 10 times. It's nuts. At least Grand Theft Auto, it's like, you know, you've got the whole online scene and everything. Than that. Oh, oh what's that? God. We made eight quadrillion dollars? Yeah, that's a reason why Grand Theft Auto V has been on three console generations. Don't get me wrong, being a live service is an incredible tool to have at your disposal, but not every game needs to be one. What publishers That's need true. to realize is that, like my new vacuum cleaner, it's okay to just make something good and leave it at that. You yeah. know, at what point does the idea of providing a service conflict with providing a fun experience? I'll tell you when, when, when it affects the bottom line. So, okay, we've established mm -hmm. that player retention is the most important factor, right, yep. in, in a successful live service. True. We need players, more players, more possibility for spending, more ways we can monetize. Management needs to hit a bottom line to continue justifying this. Sure. Again, please subscribe to my OnlyFans. Most systems in, in modern video games are focused on maximizing quite player a retention. Once you understand this, everything about modern gaming falls right into place. You begin to understand why social features have been disappearing, why um, scoreboards are, are now a hot button issue, why post-game lobbies disband, why you can't vote on maps anymore. You start to realize there's a reason games launch like shit sometimes, and why FOMO has become such a popular acronym recently. If there's a choice between adding a feature that objectively makes a game better and removing it to potentially increase player retention, what do you think the publishers are gonna choose? I played World of Warcraft for 15 years. I know the answer to this. I think that we all do. Yep. We know, we know how this goes. Uh-huh. 
Live service at its worst is the term minimal viable product. As <laughs> oh in no. The bare minimum we can do without getting sued. All we have to do is put yeah. out a game that won't get us sued. I feel like this idea of live service has been twisted and warped in the minds of some developers and publishers into thinking, well, if it means it increases player retention, then it's automatically a good decision. Not always. Developers like 343 might see the resounding success of Fortnite and Destiny. So they then try to copy what those games are doing without any regard for how it affects theirs. Same with all those shitty- Well, this is the same thing that a lot of people try to do, is that this is the same with streaming, making videos, or anything like that. Same with making games, is that, you know, they see one game or one person doing something and it working, and then everybody else goes and tries to do the exact same thing. Why do they do that? Because it worked for the other guys, and they don't think about why did it work. They're not able to accurately break down what the factors were that caused the success. They just look at the finished product and try to just replicate that without thinking about where the nuance is underneath it. Now, I think that's a big issue. Battle Royales. Once, once one person does something really, really successful, Everybody and everyone starts copying them. Yes. It happens everywhere. How many Survivors games are there now? We can't allow you to choose what color your armor is in Halo because that conflicts with the service we intend to provide through carefully controlled coatings. Stupid. No, you can't just choose the color red. You need to unlock it or pay for it. That's right. In a lot right. of examples, live service fucks with things that were already fine to begin with. When someone tells me their game is a live service, my first thought is, okay, so shit's getting cut. Instead of prioritizing a fun, rewarding progression system, companies instead bottleneck progression, monetizing it, making it as- I do think that the battle passes have become very monotonous and, um, tiresome for gamers because a lot of people nowadays, I would say that if you look at the average gamer nowadays, and you compare that to the average gamer 15 years ago, I feel like how many of you guys were like one game people? Like what was the one game that you played like 80% of the time or 90% or like 100% of the time? Like you were a one game Andy. And like now you're playing probably a bunch of different games. You're playing World of Warcraft. You're maybe playing Final Fantasy. You're playing New World. You're playing Overwatch 2. You're playing Fortnite. You're playing whatever the fuck, right? You're playing Dark and Darker. You're playing Valheim. So whenever you have all of these games that are all existing now and how this, the, the landscape of playing video games has changed tremendously because there are so many other actually very good options out there that having to have a battle pass for every single one of these games is not realistic for a normal person. This is just not, it, it, I mean, even if you play video games all the time, it's not realistic. If you're playing, you know, like 10 different video games every month and you're paying for a battle pass and the battle pass is $15 a month or something like that, $10 a month, that's like 80, a hundred dollars a month just on video games. It's a lot. And a lot of people aren't going to spend that. And even if they do spend that, then they have to spend the time inside of each one of those games unlocking the activities through the battle pass. So now it's like, okay, you've unlocked new chores to do. So yes, I do think that battle passes can come at the cost of a, uh, uh, of a, of a good rewarding experience. Uh, and, and I feel like also... Like, again, they're not fundamentally bad, but having so many of them and having them be so uniform across all of these other games, I think, has become very tiresome for a lot of players. Tedious as possible. Companies have fully tapped into FOMO culture of gaming, and now every major release is scientifically engineered by a group of computer nerds to be as addictive as possible. They've mathematically crafted games like Overwatch 2 to take 327 years to unlock every cosmetic. They have seized. That is so stupid. I don't know why they don't just change that. It seems like, like at a certain point, is this really is this really helping the game? It's just too much.
seasons, limited time battle passes, vaulted content. Get it now, get it now. It's in the store today. It's not coming back ever again. D d open your wallet, bitch. Right, like I could obsess over the stats of my own channel or I could continue doing what I think is fun for me and my viewers. I want to blank the cat. I think just making good content should be the first and only goal because everything will follow after that. When you're profit- Well, this is like the, uh, this is like the whole Steve Jobs thing where like the sales guys have control of the company and not the content guys and the product guys. And then the company, uh, you know, the company eventually like loses success and is less, less popular because the guys that can always make more sales, but sometimes a product is just good in itself. So yeah, I think this is definitely what's happened with a lot of these games. It's, it's certainly a bad thing are directly tied to the number of people currently playing yeah that creates pressure pressure that and is that's also a pressure that's created by the player base like think about how many people fixate on like the new world or the uh any steam number game any game on steam is constantly being graded based off of the amount of people that are playing it so like if there's not a lot of people playing the game dead game only relieved by keeping the engine moving keep moving forward like Aaron Yeager. At that point, progression systems become a vessel for retention, not an extension of good game design. In theory, forcing your audience to complete arbitrary challenges uh, is a great way to encourage people to keep playing longer because you can always make the challenges as arbitrary and difficult to accomplish as you want. Yeah, you always have like, and, and stupid achievements are fun to do. But again, it's like whenever the entire system the, the thing is with stupid achievements is that they're optional. That's the big difference. In theory. In reality, people don't like being told how to play a video game. How about this? Yeah. Let, let's have the most extreme example. Next Call of Duty game. The only way to level up is through a single challenge for each level. And every time, it gets more obnoxious. To get to level 2, all you gotta do, stick players with Semtex 15 times in a match. If you make that progression system, Everyone runs around trying to stick you with Semtex, and the game yeah. fucking blows. Progression systems can dictate how people play a game, and if you miss- This is exactly what happens with WoW and, uh, and parsing. Now that we have, like, raid parsing and everything, everybody just plays the game to parse. They're not trying to kill the boss, they're trying to get a good parse. This happens in Wrath, and it also happens in Retail. Handle that, it fucks it up. Live service also, as we all know, leads to the restriction and drip feeding of content. But live service can also make games far more complicated than they need to be, like Diablo Immortal with its 800 different in-game currencies or- This guy never played Tower of Fantasy. The Diablo Immortal currency system really wasn't that complicated. There was only like seven or eight different premium currencies. It's really not that many. Yeah, is like, I mean, whenever I eventually do the Tower of Fantasy full review i'm going to make a list of i'm going to write down a list probably on a sheet of paper uh, of every single currency in the game and i'm pretty sure it's got to be at least 30. a league of legends that honestly didn't need more than 120 champions you could you could have stopped there i remember when my buddy brought over the game seven days to die after I remember whenever I played Seven Days to Die, I wanted to die in seven days. It was probably one of the worst games I'd ever played in my entire life. Uh, an ex-girlfriend made me play this game with her. I killed myself in the game so I didn't have to play it with her anymore. After it came out, and all I could think was, holy shit, dude, you just got scammed. <laughs> yes. this, this video game is so bad, it's, it's a scam. It was one of the most unfinished games so, I, I'd ever so played. So bad! I didn't have the heart to tell him. He was like, yeah, it's pretty bad now. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell her either. But I hope they can fix it. And I sat there and I was like, homie, why are you playing something that don't work? I don't care if yeah. you plan to make your game better. I mean, I could say that, but like, I've done that with a lot of games. It's like, one day it will be good. I, I just know it. I just know it. One day it will be good. Maybe in two years. If it doesn't capture my interest when I play it, I'm out. Yeah. I'm a human being with limited time on this planet. I'm not going to waste it eating garbage. Sure, Sea of Thieves and No Man's Sky, they might be incredible 10 out of 10 games right now. But they weren't when I played them.
and I checked out. Your game sucks, I don't want it! Gamers have so <laughs> little patience for failed live service experiments these days because so many are already up and running with years of work put into them. I mean, Destiny had so- That's why it's so hard for these new games to come out is because like you're competing against games that have already been out for years. They have years worth of a catalog of content. So it's like, how can you come out and compete directly against that? It's really hard to do. So many updates, they had to remove content because the game was so big. Which brings me to my next point, competition. It's fierce. Succeeding at providing a live service grants the highest of highs, but failing, ooh, this is just sad to watch. Fallout yeah. 76, Anthem, Halo Infinite, Evolve, Marvel's Avengers, Battlefield 2042. Ooh. The graveyard of failed live service games is big. It, th there's a lot of graves out there. Lots of games with high aspirations that promise the world and more, and yet failed to deliver. Halo should have had a BR. I said it then, I'll say it again. Halo should have had a BR. And every Halo fanboy told me I'm wrong. Now your game is dead. Maybe it would still be dead with the BR. But we know for a fact that it's dead without it. It's unfortunate that live service games now have this expectation of I did launching say. broken and missing Battle content. Royale. Sometimes I can accept that. If if the premise of a game is so good that I want to stick around, I will. You yeah. know, Battlefield 4 was broken for like two weeks to a month, but at the end of that tunnel is arguably the best Battlefield in the series. After release, you need a dedicated team right off the bat, on the racetrack, ready to keep the go-kart moving. You've started the engine, now supply it with fuel and oil. Call of Duty, despite all of its problems and everything I bitch about, has always been really good with updates and bug fixes. You know, Vanguard might blow ass, but they added a pause feature before 2042 gave us a scoreboard. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Look at Overwatch 2. Blizzard has already had to disable three different heroes because of glitches. Well, it's also because that character sucked. Like, yeah, they disabled Torbjorn, uh, Bastion, and May. Like, I'm sorry, they weren't keep... you just re-releasing the game you had before? You can't let that happen in a game where heroes are balanced a certain way and how they fight each other. A live service should never be. We They took Bastion out of the game the day that I started playing ranked. I don't think that's a coincidence. Launched the game. Now stay tuned for when it's playable, because the store is always fully intact, yeah. no issues whatsoever. Live service has become the excuse developers use when they say fuck it and turn in their essay that has three sentences written. It's yeah, but like if you do that, there's a lot of times that like the teacher gives you like five points for your name on the page, ten points for um... Uh, like the fact that you turned it in at all, like an on time bonus. And then like, if there is proper grammar, that's like plus 20 points. So like, if you play the algorithm, you can really come out with like a 55 on an essay. That's two paragraphs. I did this all the time. Like I read the algorithm and I was like, okay, if I turn this in, this will reward me with 55 points and I will successfully complete this class with a 73. Yeah, it's normal. Why so many games are allowed to release unpolished, incomplete, and downright busted. And notice I said the word allowed. Always been Because maxing. people Always. have to approve this shit. They know what kind of game they're putting out. You don't think homie right here knew what cyberpunk was gonna be? Huh? Oh no. Think again. Look at it. Look in his eyes. He knew. Myself and the board are the final decision makers, and it was our call to release the game. Although, believe me, we never ever intended for anything like this to happen. Liar! I, I would have so much more respect for a developer if they put out their apology video on like a yacht and be like, guys, look, we wanted to get this game out. You know why, I know why. But the fact is, you're right, we fucked up. 
We're going to fix it, I don't know, probably whenever we get back. Uh, yeah, my bad. Uh, I gotta go. See ya. And that's it. You know, I would respect that a lot more than, like, these sad fucking apology videos. But smoking a, yeah, smoking a cigar without a shirt on. With, like, you're get, get being served by, like, models. Like I said, back in the yeah. day, oh, you made a shit game? Sucks to suck. Time to move on. Do you it can't again. do nothing. Now we need to make a new game that's not a dumpster fire. That was the pressure back in the day. You have one Giant shot. Watch, Wasn't yeah. always the best, but, you know, gave us Halo 2. Without the luxury of fixing it later, developers were forced to make games great on day one or not at all. If you can't hit the... I will say again, if we are talking about bugs, watch the way that Gervalin did... The fucking, uh, what is it called? Not minimize level, no echo. Uh, the fucking, uh, what was it called? The, the, the Ch Charlie's Run thing. I, I forgot even what it was. And, uh, th like, the lasso. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, legendary all, um, all skulls on or something like that. Like, there were so many cheesy things that he did. Obviously, by the way, None of us could even come close to even being able to replicate 5% of them, right? This guy's a legend. But at the same time, it goes to show the game clearly had a lot of bugs. Like, Halo 2 had a tremendous amount of bugs and problems, but it was still a good game. I think we just made do back then ground running if Deathless you keep over promising yeah. and Nuts. delaying features and putting out irrelevant roadmaps then you fall dead in the water a victim of countless other live service games doing what you're trying to do but better and gamers also have to think wait yeah. a minute should i even invest my time grinding the progression system or getting a rank when I this is why this is why people care about if a game is dying or not because they don't want to invest 180 hours into a game that has 180 players. I have no idea if they're gonna pull the plug on this in a year or two. Every yeah. time I wake up, I'm thankful I didn't play Anthem. And if you're- re I, my, my, my perspective on it now is that if I am enjoying it, I don't care about where it goes or what happens to it in the future. All I care about is am I having fun playing the game right now at this moment? And if the answer to that is yes, I keep playing. If the answer to that is no, I keep playing and I complain about it. Really shady as a company? You can use the live service to test egregious monetization and, and then change it quickly if you get backlash. Yeah. Call of Duty's not gonna, they're not gonna release the anime skins just yet, but they will because they always do. Live service Wait, is what off, the... but they will, because they always do. What Live the service fuck? is often an excuse to give players less than they had before. Halo fans should not have to wait over a year to host custom games with their friends. That is true, and this is something that Blizzard does. Blizzard removes quality of life features and then adds them back in as content. It's very tiresome. Call of Duty fans should not have to wait for a competent user interface. Battlefield fans should not be forced to wait for an actual Battlefield title when DICE fucks it up. Overwatch fans shouldn't have to wait 50 weeks just to get one legendary skin. If games- Well, at least the thing with Overwatch is you can pay to get over that one. I couldn't pay any fucking money to get Bastion back. I'm very forgiving of an overpriced skin because it's a fucking skin. Who cares? It's stupid. But I can't even play my favorite character. What the fuck? Don't succeed to expectations. The budget gets smaller. Members of the team move on to other projects. Promised features get pushed back, eventually cut. And all the people who held out hope for the game lose faith and the well dries up. Yep. When a game turns into a live service, it can blur the line between when it's complete or still a work in a progress. At what point should a developer stop updating and meddling with their own creation? League of Legends was once my most played game, but now- Well, they stop meddling with it after they ruin it. So basically, they keep meddling with it and changing it and updating it until they ruin the game, and then they try to fix it, and if they can't fix it, then it's done. Problem solved. So many of the champions I used to love playing have been completely reworked. 
For better or worse, I can never play the old Galio I used to love. And that's another thing, the skin I bought for him, I didn't know they were going to change the hero. You know what I mean? Now that skin isn't worth anything to me. Game Pass, Xbox Live, PlayStation Plus, Nintendo Online. Gaming as a service isn't going anywhere because it makes the most money that way. That's true. So while there are a lot of benefits to live service, most games aren't able to capitalize on them. And that is very, I, I think that's a very accurate assessment. Is that live service is a higher ceiling, but it's also a much lower floor. Instead, they fall into all too common pitfalls of getting too ambitious, releasing the game broken, having egregious yeah. microtransactions, and anti-fun design. Because if the game sucks, and everyone stops playing, then who's the live service for? So thank you all for watching, hope you enjoyed the video, leave a like if you did, and subscribe to the Act Man for more awesome content. This was a good and video. And don't forget to check out the Grand Mafia, get your stromboni up in there. Alright everyone, that's all I got for today, this is the Act Man, signing out. Peace! Do you have a cigar? Oh, he did, oh my god. Um, basically, yeah, I actually thought this was really good. This was a great video. Uh, it was really well put together. I, I think that, like, again, uh, I, I, I do feel like live service games, I'm very positive and, and very, uh, very good with live service games. I, I like live service games a lot, but... I think we also need to call it what it is many times where a lot of these live service games are fucking just battle pass uh like freudian uh fucking variable reinforcement schedule gotcha gambling simulators and those suck and again i think that the, like every game having a a battle pass has made it to where people don't like battle passes anymore and in the same way that like Netflix being the only thing in, uh, in, in Netflix, Netflix being the only subscription you could have was fine. Now, whenever there's a half a dozen of them or even more, now it's very annoying because you have to pick out which one you want to have now, uh, how many of them are still on your credit card. It's fucking annoying. So I, I, I don't really know like what the solution to this is. I have no idea. But it is very annoying, and I think that there are a lot of people that are going back to pirating movies and stuff like that and shows because of how annoying it is that every one of these places has, like, one good show, and they want you to subscribe to the entire service just for that one show. People don't want to do that, so they're pirating them again. And so back to pirating for sure. Yeah, and the thing is, like, with music, I, I used to pirate music. Now I don't at all. I, I have Spotify, and Spotify is great. It's an actual value add. It's incredible to think that there's something that you used to pay money for or you used to get for free, and now you're paying money for a better version of it. So I think Spotify is a great example. And uh, Spotify is really good. Yeah, exactly. Let me link you guys a video. Make sure to give it a like. Actman is a legend. He's been on my stream multiple times. And, uh, you know, if you guys know all of his history, he's been through the ringer with YouTube, too. So uh, make sure to give him some support. Absolutely, man.